always cats and steam Kaiser. And I never changed it except for getting married. And uh, you know, I was born in Fulda, Germany, <clears throat> which is about 60 kilometers from Frankfurt. We lived at Heinrichstraße 16A and uh, in a very nice residential neighborhood. The front part of the house, they're usually large. It's a living room, uh, what do you call a zimmer? A salon and a dining room. But there were always sliding doors, so you could open those doors and you had, you know, the whole family together, things, you could put the tables through it. Across the street from us was the most beautiful villa. When we came back to look at it, it was a parking lot. So it all changed. Our house was rebuilt with having stores in the bottom. Unfortunately, my mother died very young, so we had to have a housekeeper. Well, when my mother passed away, her sister was married as married. She lived in the same town that Dad came from, Hannah. And her husband passed away. And in those days, she married your wife's sister, you know, if she was widowed or available. That's what my father did. And uh, she is Margot's mother. We were four girls. And my father had a wholesale distributorship in yarn and stockings and underwear, etc. You had salesmen out. In those days, you had to supply each salesman with a car and a chauffeur, because they were too highfalutin to carry their own suitcases. So, uh, <clears throat> and my father was relatively successful. I mean, not huge, but we he, he were com very comfortable. Every Friday night, my grandpa ate with us, and then we went over to my aunt, which was his daughter. So, uh, and spent the holidays, everything. My grandfather was the most unforgettable character. He was a man that could do anything. He had, uh, first of all, in his apartment, which was on the front floor of our house, he had a menagerie. He had a squirrel, he had a little cage for it, which went round. He had, uh, you name it, one of each animal. He could cook, he could sew, he taught me to knit, he taught me to dance, not very well, but <laughs> and he was really quite a character. Mm -hmm. father went to America to see what America is all about and he came back and realized that if he wanted to immigrate to America he would have to really do physical labor work which he was not prepared to do. I mean he wasn't able to. So uh, he did nothing. In the meantime times got worse and uh, I was the first one no, actually, Dora was the first one of my family to come to New York. And then uh, a little later, I did. In those days, you could take luggage and things along, whatever you, you know, could carry on, on the mm -hmm. ship with you. And my father said, you want to take your trousseau, like silverware and so on? I said, me? Whoever marries me has to buy me so and everything. <laughs> Little did I know, it took me 10 years of married life till I got my sterling silver. But anyway, that's how I got to America. Opa leben seine Freumigkeit, Güte, sein Streben, sein Treffen, Ausspruch, mit dir, im Sinn, im Passenden, auch nicht schlimm. You know, if really? something happened, not so terrible. That's what he said. The uprising. 1932. That's quite old. Now, so that was the day I, that I left. Tante Dilla gave it to me. Oh, I see. Yes, she wrote that, and she gave it to me. And she's the one that didn't get out. She had two children in Israel, and then I, no, one is Dora is still living. Arno is not living. Marta is not living. And this is when I left, no. June thirtieth. I never knew that, 37. This is on the day of my uh, departure. Yeah. He was quite a rough guy. We lived in a community <clears throat> that was orthodox. We were strictly orthodox. We were uh, 
you know, kosher and everything else. So uh, somehow there was no problem getting kosher butcher, kosher everything. And it's a small town, you've seen it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that it wasn't hard to live that way until 1934. Then you couldn't get meat or anything anymore. All of a sudden I could eat anything. <laughs> Before that, I was very fu a fussy eater, changed quickly, mm. which should be a lesson to people. It's, uh, <clears throat> you can live differently if you have to. And uh, my parents stayed with Margot, my younger sister, and they, uh, till crystal night, till someone tipped off my father and told him to leave immediately not take anything except whatever money he can <clears throat> put his hands on. And that's what they did. They went to Frankfurt and they went to a rooming house. Well, I have to say my father always carried a visa because my uncle gave everybody an affidavit. He was just a fantastic man. So that night they got all the men together and marched them through the town to take them to a concentration camp. And <clears throat> my father said, can, can I take a taxi? I have a heart condition. Taxi, you keep marching. He said, but I have a visa in my pocket. Can, uh, so he said, you do? He was very lucky with that guy. He said, go. He let him go. And um, that's how they went to Hamburg to the ship. And you know, it was not easy to get a ticket within one day. But my father told the captain, he says, I'm going on that ship if I swim behind it. So anyhow, they got, a, I don't know what kind of accommodations, I'm sure they weren't the best. And when they got to America, we picked them up, my aunt who picked us all up. And us, the only luggage they had was a cardboard box with some oranges in it, toothpaste and a toothbrush. Mm -hmm. They had nothing. So um, that night, Chris Light, they demolished all the Jewish homes. And they threw everything, all the dishes, everything out the window, slashed the furniture. I mean, there wasn't much left. My Aunt Minna, who lived right next door to us, had some of the furniture recovered, bought new dishes, and sent a lift. In those days, you emigrate with a lift. You know what it is. It's a large container where all your furniture and everything fits in. And she sent them a lift with, well, you know, enough to have their belongings. That's how they got here. I was born at Helmut Kaiser, no middle name. Way back, I went to school in Hanau in Germany, which is about 20 kilom kilometers <coughs> outside of Frankfurt. Uh, very much interested in sports. I had a very sporty girlfriend who became lead of the Nazi youth after she left me. But while she was there, it was a nice friend. Well, my father was a banker. He went to Frankfurt on the exchange Started to change every day. Before we started, he started the bank together with another partner. And uh, he, even then, when he went to Frankfurt on the exchange, taking care of this business for his customers. The bank was quite successful, but when my father died, of course, the face of the business was gone. The partner kept the bank, but my mother and I were out. It's nothing to do with the bank anymore. I don't know if it was a final financial settlement. I don't know. I was too young at the time. There may have been a financial settlement. The bank today doesn't exist anymore. It was farmed. When we were in Germany, we looked at it. And it also was a parking lot. It's a vacant lot. It's just a, uh... it's a vacant lot. He died. It was very difficult for me to continue school. But anyhow, I finished school. After finished school, I decided I was going to leave the country. It was in 1934, and it looked very dangerous of what's going to happen. 
So I told my mother that I want to go. So she filled up one large suitcase, and with that suitcase, I went to Lyon, France. I did not have a visa. I waited in Lyon, France, until I got a visa from my uncle, who was reluctant to send it, afraid that people would later on come to him and want money from him to make a living. Anyway, after about uh, eight months or so, I finally got the visa from him. Lyon is a very interesting city. I enjoyed it. The job was not too good that I had over there, but I had to make a living. And I learned French very well, which by today I forgot all of it, but that's 80 years later, 70 years later. Now I stayed in Lyon, France for a period of about <coughs> eight months and I finally got the visa. I got a ticket for a trip back to, to Paris, not a trip to America. I got here. And they received me very well. When I came to the States, my uncle says, well, Helmut it was too German. You call you Herbert. I registered at college as Herbert Kaiser. And later on, my uncle said, well, no, it's still my bride. Let me call you Howard. So my family called me Howard. In college, they called me Herbert. And the old friends called me Helmut. <laughs> I had three <laughs> names at one time. One time, Howard was the one that really assisted. Stuck to you. I made a living when I got here. I took any kind of a job. Started out in a machine shop, then in a cotton store, then all kinds of different jobs. I finally ended up working for my uncle in his place. He had a wholesale coffee shop, coffee nut shop uh, company selling only the restaurants. I worked for him for quite a while, and in addition to that, I tried to um, uh, make various formulas for chocolate, for uh, hot. hot chocolate, for uh, gelatin desserts, and so on, while I worked over there in the laboratories, since I graduated as a chemist in Germany. No. In, 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 no, in, in, when I came to New York, I started studying. In order to get into the college, I had to go for six months into the school to learn English the way you needed in college. I started the college at night because I had to work during the day. I continued going to college, and at the same time, I was hired by the Corps of Engineers as a chemist. Since I graduated as a chemist at the time, I worked for the Corps of Engineers for about three or four years Thank during you. the war, keeping me out of the war because they couldn't. They needed me badly over there, apparently, rather than going to the war to, to Europe. But in the meantime, while we, a friend of mine and myself, decided to be going buying a business because we knew the war was going to be over, and when the war is over, you got to make a living. We found a small cosmetic manufacturer who was willing to sell at a reasonable price which we could afford. We bought the business, and at night we formulated all kinds of creams and lotions, and uh, during the day we had to work. The women. In the meantime, the women Alice, Alice went to work during the day, packing some of the stuff and trying to get customers, and sold quite a bit. It did quite well. Till finally the war ended, and I went to the business altogether with my friend. We worked up that business quite a bit, but in the long run, I figured I want to get away from New York. How we met each other. Forever. I had a very close friend from Germany who lived with my mother. My mother rented a room for him. And one day, on Sunday, this friend and my mother invited me and Alice. Well, he was a good friend of mine too. And Alice together 
Well, it didn't take very long, and I liked her a little better than my older girlfriend. And I told my friend, said, look, let's go out together, let's have dinner together. So he said, well, but I can't afford it. I said, well, I'll pay for it. Anyhow, we went out together, and that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> After that, my other girlfriend was dropped, and uh, I had a new girlfriend, which I finally, after a long time, married. Because I went to college for about a period of, well, it was nine years, but one year I didn't go, because uh, I don't know what the reason was, actually eight years. You didn't because you got married. Right. That's right, there was a reason. Hmm. And I promised your mother you'd finish. Okay, well anyway, what was my thought now? I'm sorry. You finished college. We've finished college, and I always had to wait. The only time we got together was in the evening when I came from college. She picked, she picked me up, and that time together. Sundays I had to study. Saturdays uh, I got together once in a while. But the trouble was that I took courses in chemistry, and chemistry courses usually are very late. In the next little line, 30, 10 o'clock. And it's seven o'clock in the morning, I had to back to work again. And he was a very interesting man. He was an ambitious man. I mean, not a lot of people would work during the day and go to school at night. It takes a lot of uh, doing. And uh, that impressed me, and I liked it. And so we, he had a boat at the time. You forgot to mention that. It was quite an inducement. A sailboat. No, it was not an inducement. Oh, no? <laughs> no. He took me out the first time on Decoration Day, and in New York Decoration Day, it's the worst time you can go out. It's windy, it's cold. I came home, and the next day I couldn't go to work. My eyes were completely closed. I had a wind burn. So he called me up, and he said, well, how are you? I said, don't you ever talk to me again. <laughs> But we did talk to each other again. But those were nice times. His friends always helped him. In spring you had to paint the boat and all that. It was a very, very nice time. We were in those days still the old school, so when we decided to get engaged, he went to talk to my father. So my father said to me, he's a very nice boy, but you know he's not religious. I said, yeah, I know that. So he made a go out of me. <laughs> Excuse me, you're still Jewish. Huh? You're still Jewish, <laughs> up to a point. The wedding day is May 7th, 1940, and we got married in New York. And we were married by Rabbi Hoffman, which was the rabbi that married my father in Germany. The wedding was not a very elaborate affair. It was punch and cookies, that's it. And a handful of people, that's all. I was working at the time in Mount Vernon as in, you know, that, uh, for the government as an engineer. So he wasn't home, but my mother-in-law uh, said, call me any time. She wasn't that far. Anyhow, when it became time, she went with me and uh, we took a cab. We were going to the hospital. You know, New York, everything is quite far away. And on 59th Street, he stopped the cab. He said, this is as far as I go. You have to take another cab. <laughs> so we went out. It wasn't easy to get. And as we stand on Columbus Circle, 59th Street, my water broke. <laughs> I never forget that. Then finally we get another cab to go to the, it's the Presbyterian Hospital, I think. By the time the doctor came, he said, oh, he got a long time, and ten minutes later, Stanley was born. His middle name is Victor, which is his father's name. Yeah, but his name himself was not named after Stanley anybody Stanley is not after anybody. Stanley Victor. Barry, we wanted to name after my opa. And uh, Stanley was very angry. He went to kindergarten, and we always talked about a girl. In those days, you didn't know what you were going to get. So when they all congratulated him in school about his brother, it's not a brother, it's a sister. <laughs> it took a while to get into his head that he was a brother. 
Barry was a very, very cheerful guy. I mean, we and I had com we had company, and at twelve o'clock we had coffee and cake. And he would stand in the in the um, in his crib, push the curtain away, and he was a cheery guy. He really was very, very cheerful. Stanley was, I guess, a little more serious. It was it was Barry or oh, Stanley knocked out a tooth, the baseball bat. That was in Tompkins Cove, where we had that little house. Tompkins Cove was wonderful. In the summertime, the children had a day camp. And so we women were free, and the men carpooled to New York every day. Took my mother-in-law out for Mother's Day ride up into Bear Mountain, you know the area. And there was a big sign, no development. And Dad said, well, just stay in the car a minute, I'll go. And I said, what are you going in for? He said, don't worry, I'm not going to buy anything. So he went in and comes out 15 minutes later, and he had bought a lot up there. But don't worry, we're not going to uh, build on it. I mean, we can't afford that. So that was in May, May 7. Must have been about 47, 48. No, it was, yeah, that's right. And P.S., that was in May, the end of June we moved in. <laughs> so we got a taste of country living and we loved it. So we said, that's for us. So my mother-in-law stayed with the both children and we took off for two weeks and traveled around, wanted to see where we liked it best. And we fell in love with Asheville, North Carolina, because uh, it was a beautiful city. That's where we're going to go. Young and dumb, you've got to be, <laughs> but also able and uh, willing uh, to live up to it. In other words, you had to work real hard. So we moved to Asheville and sold our little house up there. We were in it for three years. It was a wonderful community, Tompkins Cove. All Jews, played cards, that's where I learned Marja, and it was very nice. It was not a good business town. And Dad was traveling with, which we handled in business, dye stuff, chemicals. Mm -hmm. But he's not a guy to travel, to be on the road. <laughs> that didn't sit with him. He used to come home Fridays, then it was Thursday, then it was Wednesday. You can see he didn't enjoy traveling. So we bought a business, which a printing business, which really didn't. It was very hard work and didn't pay that well. Anyhow, then this bookstore became available in Rainsville, and we bought that, and that became very successful, but we didn't like living there. I mean, we moved, the last year of our stay, we moved over to Rainsville, but it uh, was a real hick town. And your Gentile friends were till six o'clock friends, people from the radio station. Oh, they were a very good friend of ours, but not in the evening, not socially, in other words. So a salesman came and told us about Wilson Greensboro. Mrs. Jervis was her name only. Port Wilson was on Green Street, and it was one store, and after we were there one year, uh, the agent that was uh, for Friendly Shopping Center came to us and said, Mr. Kaz, you have to make up your mind. In one hour, we were contacting Strawn's bookstore and I had a falling out with them. If you want the lease, you can have it. So Dad said, well, let us have a board of directors meeting. So we discussed it and we decided we're going to take it. Didn't have the money, but we felt if what was that? The poor people. If by that time we can't make it, we could always get rid of the lease. And that was the smartest decision we made. And two years after we moved to Friendly, we opened up in Durham. So... Uh, we had about 12 stores in different cities. Some, a lot in uh, South Carolina, a lot of Virginia, and there was North Carolina. Basically a bookstore which, with all the trimmings like stationery, greeting cards, art supplies. And it was a small gift 
office, for, office supplies. Office supplies. Yeah, but I mean, as far as building, a, building up a business, it's a, you have to have it, a, the ability to see what can be done in a business. And we opened up stores, we picked up the stores that the cities that needed a bookstore, that competed, well, they all had bookstores before, but we opened up anyway and we saw possibilities in each one of these cities. So all in all, we had some nice experience even in our stores. We had some people, some book people, uh, had some books signing of, t of authors in our store. Harry Golden was one Harry, of them. Harry Golden, and I had one or two others that came and signed their books. So we were pretty well known in the book business, even outside of Queen's Farm. Greensboro, I didn't have too much time for friends because I was in front of a bar mitzvah. We were remodeling our store. I was in front of Christmas. And when we bought, we were renting a house when we came here. And that house was mildew. We couldn't stay in there. So I ran out and looked around and I found a very nice little new community in, uh, on Fry Street. Didn't even hesitate. Bought a little house there. And as yes, the builder said, Miss Kyle, why don't you let me build it a little bit to your specifications? I said, I don't have time. And it was near the school, near the playground. It fitted in. We had only one car in those days. So um, we, um, we bought that little house. And two weeks after we were there, Somebody, Adrian Gaynor, Lillian Gaynor rather, gave a block party for everybody in the block. Well, the whole Jewish community lived there, and we had no idea. The Stangs, you name them, they were all living there. Weinstein, Feiner, Stang, um, Gaynor's, uh, Muriel Half, they all lived there, Sylvia Silver, they all lived in that tall little area. It was so strange, I had no idea what I bought it because I didn't have time to check out and check around. But at P.S. came Christmas, I had a, a breakdown. It was a little bit too much. But uh, we survived it. So uh, we fell right into that. We immediately joined the synagogue, naturally, because in Ashford belonged to the temple, which was awful. So uh, we stayed, everybody stayed there about five years that we built this house. Stanley's wedding, it poured. That was in Durham. It was a disaster. Huh? It was a disaster. Right. It rained, everything had to go inside where they had planned to have it outside. The night before we had a rehearsal dinner, that was beautiful at the yeah. Blair House. That was very, very nice. And the wedding was nice, but it was, it got ruined by the rain. Because we had to move from wherever the wedding was to the hotel. And then we had a uh, brunch in the morning, and everybody had to get up to introduce themselves. And I'm uh, Jenny Kaiser, friend of the Kaisers, very real kind. They went around and then came to Barry and said, I'm Barry Kaiser, friend of the Goldbergs. <laughs> Never forgot that. <laughs> they had a beautiful wedding, Sharon, really. And it was typical New York. They had a big buffet before, and then the ceremony, and then a big dinner. And then they rolled out the um, Viennese table, and Molly Goldberg screamed, Oh no! She's never <laughs> seen anything like that. practically all over the world. The only place we did not travel is Russia. And there we were in St. Petersburg, but otherwise we were in China, we were in Indonesia, we were in India, we were in uh, Singapore, we were in Malaysia, we were in uh, Hong Kong, we were in Hawaii, of course. Now we were seeing quite a bit. 
because he went to Europe many times. Mm. He saw Italy, Brazil, uh, Portugal, Spain, France. Go to Europe, throw it in my car, and go to Europe first. I'm and, sorry, we can't do that anymore. And then take cruises or go on your own to all these foreign countries. We went on our own very many times. No matter where, we went to, um, to Morocco, we went to uh, uh, Marrakesh, we called, rented the car in Marrakesh and traveled around. You know, we did a lot of things that normal people may not do, but we took chances. Don't yeah. you dare call me not normal. <laughs> See, with the two, you're being herded into the bus, out of the bus, one night here, one night there. We don't like that. One night stands. We never, never took a, t a tour in Europe. We took tours outside of Europe and we went to China. Some place you cannot go unless you're on a tour. Mm -hmm. We went to Australia, we went to New Zealand. I mean, there are very few places we haven't seen. But we were fortunate, we most of the time traveled with another couple, which makes it nice. I happen to be the resort a town spa. <coughs> consists of maybe 20, 24 hotels. Over there you get hot mud bath. There's a certain amount of water coming out of the earth and the mud absorbs that water. And then you go and can have mud bath over there, which supposedly help your body for arthritis and all kinds of other things. Could use it right now. And we, when we started out, I don't know exactly the year, but we were there for five or six times in a row. The facilities are beautiful. That town is a typical resort town with no people, no cars in the center of town. You walk around without cars. We traveled out it's not, not too far from Verona. It's very close to Venice, and we stayed in Avano for a week or ten days. We went to Venice about two or three times during that time, and uh, we know Venice very well now. Verona we don't know so well yet because I, I, Mom got lost one time in Verona. That's I know we were on a ship one time. Last year. And uh, they uh, had some kind of a game that Anybody over under over under thirty had to get out of the group under forty. Married under. Married, married uh, uh, thirty years. Married forty years. We the only ones that married fifty years or more. We got a bottle of champagne. But then he asked us, "What makes you live as long as you do and be happy? Just well to drink a day." <laughs> From that time, we were known on the ship for the people with the drink and <laughs> And you have wonderful experience, you have rough experiences, but... Uh, but bad experience. It's very... What else? It gives you a lot because now that you're older, you remember all that. I wish we could go, but I can't go anymore. Mm. I tell you, we had a very nice life with our business getting better making some money that we could travel. Really, we had a very nice life for, for 67 years. Or not, but rather for, how many, 67 years, we had a very pleasant life. Actually, no moment or any year or occasion that we had troubles, either financial or within our marriage and so on, never occurred to us. So all in all, I can say that we had a very, very happy marriage. They just live an honest life, don't have grudges against people. Take people the way they are. You have to, they're not going to change. And uh, be honest in your life and try to be ambitious to get places. Try to make money because money helps you to be happy and you want to live a happy life. So try to get ahead in life with as, as much as you can and as, with as much ambition as you can. That's about it. Opa is a very gentle man, and he's uh, very ambitious, hardworking. Good thing I sit next to you. <laughs> <laughs> very honest and uh, charitable. Well, what would you say if I don't sit next to you? 
I'm not going to say. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't. I couldn't have done much better, or any better, I should say. As a very ambitious woman, very uh, friendly with everybody. She's very nice, extremely nice to most everybody that's around. She's very good at telephoning. And uh, as a wife, uh, I can't complain at all because she's wonderful to me. What else can I say about her? Well, she's very well liked wherever she goes. That's one sure thing. At least I think she is. It's just that you think so, you don't. Right, so anyhow, that is, that is it. Mm -hmm.